Well, I had I had had some practical experience before I did a doctoral degree, and one of my practical experiences was being uh, in the uh, I'd been in the what's now the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I was very young when I uh, enlisted for the Army, but I'd. Uh, I'm changing this a little bit, but I'm just adding to it. Um, when I went in the army, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to be a paratrooper. My father told me, "Why do you want to be a paratrooper? Why don't you do something that would have some benefit to you after you get out of the army?" Which was, he was exactly right, and um, he talked me out of this. Well, he he said, "Don't they have something else you might do?" So I went to the recruiter and I said, what else might I, what else is there? You know, now I'm just a young, I'm, I'm only 18 and a half years old. Okay? And they said, well we have, maybe you'd like to study Chinese or Russian. And I said, oh maybe, I'd still like to jump out of airplanes. Um, anyway, what happened was I took a test. Uh, it was an artificial language like Esperanto or whatever, and I got a virtually perfect score. So they said, well, you can go and study Chinese for two years with the uh, Defense Language Institute in California, in Monterey, California. And I said, that's interesting, and I did decide to do that. Then they canceled that prog program, or it was rescheduled, and they said, do you want to stay idle for six months at some base? Or do you want to take Russian? And it was accident. It was an accident. And I said, okay, I'll take Russian. So anyway, I took Russian. So I was in the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I'd had practical experience in Germany. I was in, uh, as I said before, I was in Kassel, <clears throat> in Frankfurt, and sometimes uh, Lübeck, in the north. And um, so that was part of my practical experience. I also was a Peace Corps volunteer later. And I was in Senegal, West Africa. We were the first group, <clears throat> and you know I taught English, and I also coached track and field. And those experiences made me want to do something uh, educationally. I knew I wanted to go on for a graduate degree, but something educationally would, which would have some influence or impact on on the world, you know. So. Among other things, I had the idea that I was going to go into diplomacy and I would solve diplomatic problems. I was, you know, as many people are at that age, you're mid-20s or 22, 23, a bit naive, but that's basically why I, I did what I did. On mixed methods, uh, there have been maybe, I was counting this morning, uh, six to eight projects that I've worked on. Either myself as part, as, the, as part of a team or with a doctoral student as a dissertation. And there's a method that we use that I've used a lot and it's called repertory grid. And it's from a psychologist named George Kelly and it's called the role repertory grid. But what it is, is an interview, a very simple interviewing procedure whereby uh, I'll ask, uh, say I'll ask you, uh, say there'll be six policy alternatives, and I'll ask you, uh, I'll pre-randomize them, actually, the six, into sets of three triads. And I'll just keep going down the triads, and each time I'll ask you, how are any two of these policies similar and different from the third? What happens qualitatively in an interview is you pull up a construct, and the construct may be, well, this one's inefficient, this is, these two are inefficient, this one's efficient. Uh, I go to the second one, and it, you may say, well, these two are really uh, unjust, and the other's fair. And we go through. What happens is, by the time I'm finished with the interview, and I've done, I've done them in this building, um, with uh, job trainees, uh, that was the context. But um, what happens is, at a certain point, all of us run out of constructs, because we don't have constructs to apply anymore, and we start to repeat, I, I'll repeat efficiency or job, or fairness or whatever. 
so that there's a natural ending point to every interview. Second, that ending point means that I've got this collection of constructs which are, provide the elements of a frame of reference towards a problem. Or in this case, the problem is how to select among these alternatives. It could be how to select among these automobile types or toothpaste or whatever. It could be a marketing problem. But I've used this again and again to get at individual differences uh, and then pool the difference, pool, pool everything, all the constructs from all the persons that I've interviewed. Uh, and then I use that and I teach to and run my courses, I do this. Uh, I have them then pool them and then I create the questionnaire. Now, does it make any difference? Again, what difference does it make when you do some of these things? It makes a huge difference. Uh, what we've done is compare a questionnaire created, actually a standardized questionnaire created by somebody else with a questionnaire that includes all those items, but also includes the items that I've got from these repertory grid interviews. And I put them into the questionnaire. Typically the R square goes up by at least 50% if I do it that way. Now, that to me is showing that it makes a difference. And not just saying, uh, as many people do, I like mixed methods. Why do you like mixed methods? I like myth well, I could like it for various reasons. Uh, it makes me comfortable. I don't want to be known as just a quantitative person or a qualitative person, whatever. But this says I like mixed methods because they give me a result that's much more credible than I would have otherwise. So. But what I did was, I'm interested in, I teach a course in philosophy of science, or philosophy of policy sciences, and um, I'm very interested in epistemology, and basically the method, methodological framework is uh, a kind of breakdown of different, the different forms of reasoning and rationality that one finds in uh, doing policy analysis. So it was broken down into its elemental parts first, related, and then within those different parts, uh, methodological ovals, for example, uh, you can start to hang different methods. For example, in forecasting, we not only have econometric forecasting, but we also have Delphi technique, we have cross-impact analysis, we have scenario uh, construction, and so forth and so on. But, in fact, there are hundreds of forecasting techniques that are used today, right? But how does one keep track of all of these forecasting techniques? Well, one way to do it is to look at their function and to circumscribe them uh, functionally as one, type, one part of the methodological process of doing policy analysis. So basically, to answer the question, I went back to the uh, basic uh, epistemological functions that one can identify and then built out from that. Uh, I found at the time, I, I, you know, there were so many books written on techniques and methods of policy analysis, and uh, there were a lot of books written in political science on political science methods, so forth. I found this all quite unsatisfactory because it was all over the place. It was a, a huge map and you didn't know where you were. And so that's what I wanted to do and that's what I did. That's, that's what I did, so uh, that was my motivation. I'm doing another book on pragmatism and the policy sciences. And um, one of the things one finds in the pragmatist tradition in this country, and after all, the only philosophy that's indigenous to this country is pragmatism. We don't have constructivism, we don't have critical theory, we don't have hermeneutics, we don't, right? Uh, we, we're, we're, we didn't have logical empiricism, uh, we didn't have our Vienna circle, or New York circle, or Pittsburgh circle, or whatever. Uh, so it's, it's pragmatism. And uh, the pragmatists, both John Dewey and especially Charles Sanders Peirce, talked about uh, 
problem structuring in a very interesting way. And if you look at this, uh, look at their work, what you find is uh, they're identifying for any problem solving process a stage at which we have a diffuse sense of worries, we have uh, like kind of inchoate signs of stress, we have surprises. Basically, we have a suspension of belief because we don't know what to do. We have goals, values, but even there, we may not know whether those are the right goals and values. Um, they wrote about this, but then wrote about how one comes from that situation into problem solving. And problem structuring is a central guidance system because in many, uh, I'm tempted to say most cases of analysis that one does in political science, sociology, uh, economics, we run into the, for example, the problem of the om omitted variable bias. The omitted variable, bi omitted variable bias can be handled as a statistical problem or an econometric problem and we can look at error terms and residuals and so forth and so on. But the central problem is we, we didn't know what the variable was. That's why it's omitted, right? And problem structuring, uh, I'm just, this is just one example. Problem structuring, in effect, uh, tools of problem structuring give us the capacity to help identify the omitted variables, for example. Whereas otherwise, we don't have, we don't know that we've even approximated the domain of these omitted variables, uh, control variables, conditional variables, different types of variables that we've left out. And, uh, and, and then we compensate for that statistically. And okay, if we're in that situation, we compensate statistically. We look at correlated error terms, or we, we look at different forms of regression, we look at instrumental variables. Okay, but uh, that's because we haven't, to me, that's because we haven't paid enough attention to problem structuring. What goes into the problem in the first place? And uh, I'd like to be able to convince my economist friends that they should do this. So we don't have to, you know, talk about instrumental variables uh, or, or omitted variable bias. Uh, if you must know King, Cohen, and Verba. Well, the cut-down econometric models there are uh, interesting, but the one on omitted variable bias, I'll, I always kind of laugh about it, because it, it, you have omitted variable bias, be, okay, you already have it, because it, it's omitted. Well, why was it omitted in the first place? Because you didn't go through a process of problem structuring. We sit there and we think we can do, uh, we know just what those five variables are, seven, and we eliminate two because they didn't, uh, the correlations were too small with the adjusted r squared, whatever. Um, we need to do more problem structuring. So. And not just talk about problem structuring as a general matter, but also what are the tools or methods of problem structuring that are available, and they, there are, they are available. <clears throat> we can use them. I was saying yesterday in the, the workshop on wicked problems, uh, or ill-structured problems, wicked problems, I was saying that it's interesting that if you look at the, the literature, which would include well over a thousand books in the, between 1967 and 2008, well over a thousand books, uh, and you use Google Ngram to, you know, uh, look at a time series in effect, uh, most of those books were written in Europe. Most of the articles are written in Europe. Problem structuring and wicked problems and ill-structured problems are not uh, addressed here very well. The, relative, the frequency of attention to wicked or ill-structured problems here is a tiny part of the whole, which is in other countries in Europe. Uh, somebody ought to look into this and look at the conditions uh, what, why this is so, and I don't know why it's so. Well, in my, in my understanding and my work in this area, uh, first of all, and this would be some years ago when I started looking at evidence-based policy, evidence is one of those terms that's very difficult to define, right? 
what is evidence? Well, it depends on your background assumptions. If evidence for uh, an attorney or somebody working in law, evidence for someone working in law is maybe a statute, a constitutional amendment, uh, or maybe a case, if we talk about case law in the Anglo-Saxon American tradition of case law. Uh, so that's evidence. But if you talk to somebody else, a, somebody who's doing a quantitative analysis of uh, political change, for example, evidence would be, um, you know, evidence would be reliable and valid data that we could input into a uh, computer program, into soft, some software program, and run uh, scatter plots and run normal probability plots and do all those things that, that's evidence. The point being that if you start talking about evidence, it depends on the background assumptions and values of the person who's defining evidence. So for, for somebody in law, it's different from somebody in quantitative analysis. It's different from somebody in aesthetics. It's different from somebody in ethics. Uh, so that was difficult. What, what I've come around to in the last uh, five to seven years, I suppose, in a couple of big projects in this area, is that um, it's useful to, to, find, to define evidence in terms of causal relevance. And to, <laughs> some people disagree with this quite a lot, but uh, the people I admire and respect as methodologists and theorists, I don't think do disagree with this. Uh, they would be econometricians, and economists, as well as political scientists, sociologists, and policy types. They wouldn't disagree with this. So we're, we're after causal inferences. And my other mentor was Donald Campbell. And, you know, we're after causal inferences. And the question is, what types of evidence do we need in order to make a causal inference? Which I take to be a design problem. Because unless one has temporal precedence, one's not going to be able to talk effectively about causal inferences. You can try to play around with it econometrically by looking at cross-leg correlation models or do those kinds of tests. But we know that that's you know, just a, a way to get at temporal precedence, but we don't know whether anyone actually manipulated a variable or not. So we don't have a design there. It would be, sometimes they be call that a natural experiment, but I, I, I don't really agree with that. But, uh, uh, so, Evidence-based policy is, is uh, the way I've been looking at it, is uh, a policy based upon evidence that produces causally relevant uh, generalizations or claims. And that becomes a design problem. So it's not only pre-test, post-test, or temporal precedence, uh, or an extended time series, uh, but it also, uh, and I'm fond of this expression from Francis Bacon, in order to do a design that's going to give you causally relevant findings, you've got to twist the tiger's tail. To understand the tiger, or sorry, the lion actually, you've got to twist his tail. You can't just observe him as it, you know, the observer theory of uh, science, social sciences. We don't just, we're not neutral observers. In a design, you've got to go in and manipulate something and try something out. And that doesn't necessarily mean what uh, many people think it means. Uh, they think it means doing a laboratory experiment. Uh, no, it's, it's not pretest, post-test, control group, experimental group, or treatment group, randomization, and then if it's inadequate, doing propensity score matching, or, or something like this. No. Uh, Experimentation in the larger sense is taking action in an environment to find out what works. And the key word in evidence-based policy is, for just about everybody, what works, question mark, what works. And uh, when uh, recently I did a large research synthesis meta-analysis of literature on uh, governance, uh, civic education and uh, political participation and social capital and so forth. And 
started out with thousands of studies. If you look at the thousands of studies, about 90% of them are case studies which, about which I may be exaggerating a little bit now, but about which you can't, I have no confidence in, in the inferences made because I don't know who made the inferences, I don't know what kind of bias there may have been in the observations or the interviews and so forth. And uh, uh, Steve Finkel and I, I mean Steve is the best on, in this area, uh, civic education, civic particularly, he, he's the best in this area. And his studies were the best, they stood out, I mean there's three or four of his studies, two or three of them, that stood out as methodologically and design-wise very, very competent. But the vast literature in this area is, doesn't permit causally relevant claims. And uh, so for me, evidence-based policy has to do with basically, a, as many people, a hierarchy of types of designs coming from uh, meta-analysis which combines studies to uh, uh, experiments, pre-test, post-test, randomized control trials or field trials, down to quasi-experimental designs and uh, panel studies, and then as we go down, correlation studies, regression studies, which are not, don't have the leverage we have with any of the others. So for me, evidence-based policy has to do with that hierarchy or grade of designs. As we go up the hierarchy into higher grade designs, we're talking about stronger evidence because it's causally relevant. But I'm, I'm, I'm very much committed to uh, mixed methods of designs. And I think one of the unfortunate things that's happened uh, in the literature on methods and experimentation is that uh, qualitative methods that get at the motivations or intentions of actors have been left out because it's viewed as non-causal. And if you take a book like KKB, they treat that as non-causal. It's, it, it's not, uh, basically it's the context of discovery, it's a heuristic. You can't test hypotheses. That's wrong, that's simply wrong. That comes from a misunderstanding of Max Weber and that comes from a misunderstanding of the European tradition of uh, uh, both phenomenology but also the tradition of interpretive understanding from Max Weber and predecessors. So when I do work on design, and I've done a number of projects like this, I will combine in a regression model, uh, an experimental model using regression, uh, uh, I will combine qualitative methods. And uh, if I went through and explain and, and describe some of these studies, uh, here's the claim and here's what, what happens. We increased the, the explained variance, the R square, by 50% at least by including qualitative data or variables, qualitatively measured variables, into a regression equation. And when I teach this subject, this is what I teach, uh, that design is critical, evidence is critical, uh, and we need quantitative methods, we need regression, we need, quote, econometric models, although these models are not econometric, they're polymetric models, because we're, we're not going to cede everything to the economists they didn't develop all these methods. E economics was irrelevant to most of them. Uh, it was ag agronomy and, uh, and other areas. But um, the example I use is you, there, there are some very sophisticated time series models for energy uh, forecasting. One's the Wisconsin energy model. Uh, in an experiment on the West Coast uh, that I uh, looked at, um, they took one group of homes and they insulated them. They put thermopane glass in and they had monitors to monitor the water, the heat, the expenditure of gas, uh, and so forth and so on. Then they had the control homes. And what they found over time, and this is a sophisticated time series one, they found that for both groups, there were these spikes that they couldn't explain. And of course, the spikes eat up some of your explained variance, so the error term is going up. The standard error goes up. So 
what was done? Uh, energy anthropologists from Princeton were part of the team, and they went in and looked at the experiment. And they said, well, what could account for the spikes? So they go into each home and interview the head of the household and, and say, how do you use your thermostat? The wall, two minutes. How do you use your thermostat? The answer was there were two groups. One, he, one they called valve theorists. When it gets cold or warm, if you're air conditioned, you change the thermostat yourself. If it's cold when I come in in the winter, then I crank it up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, then when I feel comfortable, I turn it down. Well, that's very inefficient. And guess what happens? It causes spikes. Okay. The other group were, were called the uh, homeostat group, homeostatic group. They would set it, at, as many of us do, at uh, 69 degrees, 68 degrees, and leave it. Set it. You'll get a smooth curve. So the point here is that the variance that's explained by the original model uh, is uh, actually uh, very it's, it's an inefficient model because it doesn't take into account the variance that you could only discover through qualitative analysis of interviews with the heads of household who, in effect, use our thermostat very differently. And who would know that if you didn't do that kind of work? I would have benefited immensely from my advisor spending much more time with me and working out with me, uh, and this is what I try to do with doctoral students, working out the uh, research question or research problem I was going to address. And the old adage goes that a problem well defined is a problem half solved. <clears throat> and I, I do believe that. And I, uh, in my, my own mentoring, um, I spend a lot of time on that, that question. And I think as, uh, as I count up the times, I think every doctoral dissertation probably takes oh, 20 to 25 or more one hour to one hour and a half sittings. Uh, you've got to have time to discuss these things. The second thing is to try to encourage students to take a problem about which they have some passion. They really care about the problem. Because if you don't care about the problem, you get halfway through a dissertation and you say, I don't know why I ever did this. You know, and you wear out energy, you expend the energy, you're tired, and so forth. So. Uh, and further, if it's a doctoral program, you find that um, later on, any doctoral student who graduates and goes into teaching at a university, you, you've got to have that passion to drive you forward. You have to want to be there. And uh, I think, unfortunately, in a number of cases, we have faculty who don't. They're there because, rational reasons, they have to make a mortgage payment, a car payment, or whatever, right? Something like that. Feed the children, uh, you know, so forth. Now you do all that, but you, the, the passion is really important. And but again, the question is very important, and that also is a question of problem structuring. Problem structuring. What is the structure of that problem? When we start dissertations or any project or a, a book or anything else, it basically is an ill-structured problem. We have to structure that problem. I mean, I know in my own work, it, it takes me a lot of time in the front end of a, a, like a book. I, I, I've got to have a lot of time at, uh, before I start to begin to structure the problem, or that's my style at any rate. I know people have different styles. Some people like to jump right in and start writing. Somebody you know very well. <laughs> uh, we've talked about this, you know. Uh, but, uh, so those are the two things I would do. I mean, I was lucky enough to get this mentor award at the University of Pittsburgh, and you know, I, I, when I looked at the retrospectively at the uh, qualifications, and I thought about what I'd been doing, what I'm telling you now is sort of a reconstruction of what I, I think I've tried to do. So.